know when they see a female founder coming to you this is in general they'll think oh a girl has walked in if you don't know the client so i can take her for a ride i'll tell her really i will tell her uh, you have to do this for me within 500 bd it means you have to do it for me within 500 dinar even if that uh, that assignment or that specific project is valued at 2000 So how long you been in Bahrain now? So I moved to Bahrain in 2012. Okay. So it's been almost 10 years. Okay. And how did you find Bahrain? Did you just look up on Google Maps and was like that's the place I want to move to? So I was born and raised in Dubai. Okay. And then I moved to Oman. Okay. So I was working for an ad agency there and then one fine day I decided that I'm bored. Mhm. Of Oman. Mhm. And I said, you know, now I want to move. somewhere maybe to a new country so shall i move back to dubai and then one of my friend comes to me colleague work colleagues and they say oh there is this vacancy at this company called red house okay so why don't you apply oh my god so from the very beginning oh god okay so i said okay maybe let me just uh, you know find out find out and then i did and then they invite uh, they asked me to come for an interview and then they said okay join we are looking for someone to take over the magazine mm. it's not doing that well but then i'm sure you can add value some to it. value to it so then and that was woman this month and what was your base salary back then for the invite 500 500 oh okay that's 50 bd above minimum in yes, bahrain that's that's yes. good yeah yeah so so then that's what it is and then um in 2013 so when i joined uh, when i moved to bahrain mm-hmm. uh, i thought uh, okay i'm i like this place maybe i'll work here for 2 years mm-hmm. and then i'll go back to oman but from 2 years to 5 years and now it's 2022 so bahrain is now like home you could say you don't want to go back to dubai i don't think so really no because we do work with clients in dubai as well we work with some agencies there are some uh, small jewelry companies as well that we work with okay so so then that that relationship is there but uh, you know moving to dubai at this stage i don't think so once you've set up everything and you know where do you go you know who to meet who are your clients so i think this is the best place in terms of you know is i think it's the easiest place in terms of setting up your business and running it But how did, how did that so how does that process work wait if you don't mind me asking for dubai for for starting up your ad agency okay because i imagine a lot of people are listening right now either are interested in getting into marketing or potentially running an ad agency and they're not making ends meet what would be what would you say are some of the key things to hit to get high paying clients okay So I think the first thing is when what a client looks for when mm-hmm. you go and pitch is that they're looking for quality mm-hmm. and they're looking for assurance and satisfaction. So these three are the main points. So if you're if you are producing work as per their requirements and if they are they have to be happy with whatever you know you have to make sure that whatever you commit you excel in that. Okay. So And how do you just cold pitch them and you just call up their marketing department and say like hey you know what we're a print publication or we do social media or we do this and try to get that meeting through there or do you just use your contacts that you have available and So work most your way of them way? are are through contacts mm-hmm. and sometimes there is uh, we also get a lot of references mm-hmm. so you know with reference to we are looking for somebody you know we are having opening a store we are looking for um an using agency. your network basically yeah So so that's the and of course cold call also I think it also plays a very important role. Oh does that still work? It still works. Yes. You won't believe it does. Really? So uh there was this meeting in Hamla mm-hmm. where we had gone to meet a client that was in a studio. It was a yoga studio. And then we just walked out of the studio for some karak chai. Mm-hmm. And right next to uh the karak chai counter was this huge factory. that produces marbles and they are into all of that and then the the number was listed outside the the door and so we just saved the number and the next day my staff 
called and said hi how are you we are pink media house uh, will you be are you looking at you know uh, are you looking business. at marketing or any other uh, opportunities they said yes we're looking for somebody to help us with social media well there you go and then the, the next day we went and then they said oh we were we were desperately looking for the last two months but whatever agencies we work with previously uh, you know we were not happy and either they they don't work as per our requirements or they are too expensive so i said you know, we'll work out something as we'll tailor make something for you so so that's how so i think cold call also does help even in today's uh, age yeah it does how how do you have that relationship with that client because i know a lot of clients want you know the cow, want the cow on the farm and the moon and and the sun they yeah. want everything and everything and yes. they want they'll to pay you, you peanuts yes yes so they'll they'll give you one dinar and they'll say like yeah you know mashallah I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i want everything so then when you go uh, so first of all i think also it's very important as an entrepreneur that whenever you pitch uh business deals or proposals to any client you have to make sure of your energy around them you know make sure that that you, and they they should know that you are a tough nut mm -hmm. if you can do their work you can you know you if you can help them mm -hmm. uh, and assist them in growing it also doesn't mean that you know they will cut corners because uh, you know you, both of them it's like it's like it's an equal partnership between uh two companies It's very interesting because from from my brother's side, obviously we talked a little off camera. Yeah. That he he's been running a marketing agency for I think he's he's been working in marketing for close to fifty years. Yeah. And his own marketing agency about for thirty years. And one of the things he would always tell me was that with a client, you have to make clear to them that they're investing into their business. Like, you know, and he always makes the point of you wouldn't you wouldn't try to bargain. to buy a Lamborghini. You wouldn't try to bargain to buy a Bentley, yes, yes, right? That's yes. just the price of the cost, right? Yes, and that's I the investment that you have to put in. And the other thing he would always tell me was that he has a fixed rate yes. and he doesn't go below it. Yes, so we have a fixed uh, rate cards. Mm. We have a media kit mm. that is shared to them. Mm. Uh, you know, it's only like thirty percent of the time is when they come to you and they say the client says this is our budget and we want to work around that. If we can, we do it. Otherwise, we will not take up that that job. Absolutely. If it's there has been cases where uh, I have had two clients in the last last week. They've come up to me and they one wanted to uh, wanted us to help them to launch an app, mm -hmm. but the budget was abysmal. nothing okay so i was like i'm sorry we can't do this for you i wonder if you've noticed the same thing is that the lower the amount the more demanding the client yes yes isn't oh that weird God. yes i have suffered i've gone through that yeah road. <laughs> yeah it's so yeah. it's so bizarre to me it's that like a client that pays you 200 bd expects like all this extra 20000 dinar worth of service exactly and a client that pays you 5000 bd is like very happy to yeah <laughs> it's very little pushback on yeah. <laughs> so you you've given us 5000 dinar okay just and the one so so we don't we we filtered basically you have to you yeah. have to so there's a so you know like i think each agency has their genre and they tailor make certain things and they know exactly you know who are the clients they wish to work with because it's it's two sides mm basically you can say like like it's two families coming together because you you need to have a long term relationship mm, mm. Uh, with your client you know in order to make it fruitful and successful when i when i've started working here in bahrain is that the expectations that they have compared to the budget that they assign is unrealistic yes and i mean i've worked in the us and i've worked in europe and there's there's rationality here on the other hand It's it's almost like they just try their best. Yeah. And then they're surprised when you say no. Yes. <laughs> it's so strange. Why don't you want to work with us? Yeah. Cuz mm -hmm. you you can't afford me. <laughs> yeah, that's what. I had I had one guest on and we were talking about business structures and business plans. And then he said, "Hey, you know what? Um I'd love for you to 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 come in and talk to my team." And I was like, "Okay, but either you're paying me or I'm bringing the cameras in 
to do production around it. At least I have some footage. Mm. And he was like, oh, you don't, can't you just come in for free? And I was like, no. <laughs> so I'll tell you a case that happened. It was, I think, about a year and a half ago. There was this client, he wanted us to film uh, something related to his factory. Mm. The entire filming was an ATA process. So yeah. first of all, he asked us for a quotation. We sent him the quotation. Then after that, uh, my videographer and my media manager, both of them went to meet the client. So he tells them, you have to make a teaser under three minutes of how you're going to film the ATA process. Get the hell out of here. And then they come back to me and say, ma'am, we have to do this. I said, no, we are not doing this. We don't need this money. And then I called up the client. I said, on what basis mm. uh, are you expecting us to film for eight hours? And after that, you're going to, no, we need to see the quality. I said, we've al always, we've, we've already shared with you our samples. So now it's up to you. You to know what they, why they wanted that? They yeah. wanted it in order to use it for their Instagram and social yeah, media. That's exactly, exactly why yes. they wanted it. That happened to Danny, who's, who's not yeah. here. He's, he, he said that um, he went to shoot a client uh, like for footage and stuff like that. And they said, okay, can I get like a preview of how it looks like from the, the day's footage? Yeah. So he did one with watermarks okay. from his company on it. And the client just took it and then published it. <laughs> they, they, they did that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and he wanted us to send him a storyboard. So I said, we usually charge. If we send you a storyboard, we usually charge because, you know, we have the copyright for the same. So, you know, you have to know how to tackle them. That's, it's all about that. Otherwise, they'll take you for a ride. I mean, I, I, I think with that client specifically, I don't think he really... I don't think he really understood what a storyboard or a script or a subtext is. I think yes. he heard these key terminology in the industry and it was like, oh, okay. Let's, <laughs> let's experience and yeah. see what it is. Well, if it was an eight-hour footage, how long was the final shoot supposed to be? What was the... the uh, eight hours footage and then we were supposed... Eight-hour footage is in footage eight hours? Yes, eight hours. The shoot was, was for eight hours. No, the shoot was for eight hours, but deliverables... Uh, was for 30 minutes. For 30 minutes. Yeah. Okay, that sounds about right. Yeah. Because, uh, okay, and it was supposed to be what, just a YouTube video? A YouTube video, yes. Okay. And then with the trailer, with the script, with the storyboard, everything. <laughs> is he trying to make a short movie? What, what is he talking about? So like, I was like, no. And then, uh, so then I went and I, uh, so he was the manager. I went, uh, I gave a, uh, I called up the, uh, the CEO. Mm. I said, look, we've got a long relationship. I've known you from 2012. Mm. But this guy who you've just appointed doesn't know what he's doing. Mm. Because if you want to keep a good relationship with the media, you should know exactly what you're talking. Mm. So and then, how much you're paying, right? Yeah. So I'm just say, give it, we'll first see it and then we'll sign the contract. That's not happening. Yeah, I yeah. agree. Yeah. I agree. And uh, many a times, what it, how is it, it has happened with us and especially, uh, especially with me. You know, when they see a female founder coming to you, this is in general, they'll think, oh, a girl has walked in if you don't know the client. So I can take her for a ride. I'll tell her. Really? I will tell her, uh, you have to do this for me within 500 BD. It means you have to do it for me within 500 dinar. Even if that, uh, that assignment or that specific project is valued at 2000. So over time and through experience, you know, after falling and getting up and again falling, I've decided no. When I walk into the office, they know who they are speaking to. I'm very firm. Interesting. Yeah. Because this is the exact opposite of, of what happens in Europe. Because girls get way higher bids yeah. on a project than guys do. Yes. In, in the West. Yes. It's so interesting. It's completely the opposite way yeah. around. And if, if, if a girl, especially like uh, my brother would always like, like send a pretty girl in to the meeting yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. And he would always get about 20 to 30% above the, the, the listing price who yes. was originally negotiated. Yes, yes. And he said, if I go in there, yeah. right, they would try to bring the price down. It's fascinating yes, yes. how it's exactly the opposite. So I think here you have, you could, you could say you have an assorted mix. Mm. Like you, in, in certain places you go, the client knows you. Mm. You know, they don't bargain. Behind is very small, yeah. Yeah. But then if you have a new client, he's trying to understand what is your role, where have you worked before, you know, what you've done, what does the company do. 
so then in in that case um, you know sometimes so there are all sorts of cases that you have to deal with yeah i i've i've i mean i've i've noticed the how vastly different it's almost like almost like a valley of the difference of quality that that you find here in this region versus the, how you find in the west how business interactions are made how contracts are made uh like everything f- because i i worked from the us side and so when i came here it, it was like almost like a slap in my face because of how things are done yes. it's it's crazy and i it's wonder crazy, yeah. do do you, when you moved from oman and dubai to bahrain did you notice the difference of of work ethic between the two or not so much yes you did yes yeah so dubai is super fast mm-hmm. okay so like for instance you go to meet a client you've met the client the moment you you get into your car you call your so you have like a media assistant sure and you tell her this is i'm sending you the the email address of the client quickly send them the proposal this is what it is da 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 mm. it's so fast so before I love you forget it. okay i love it in oman it's a little laid back so you go to meet the client on sunday you come back you send him the proposal next sunday he'll tell you he's going to look at the mail mm. but Oman on the other side uh, has a lot of like there is a lot of money in Oman mm. because you've got Sohar you've got Nizwa you've got all the other places so in terms of uh, you know in terms of doing events you can do like a large scale event in Oman for 200000 mm. but to do that same event in Bahrain you might not get of course, the, the no same way. funding or no the way. same sponsorship so that's the difference between both the places but uh, but bahrain as you know people here they they move fast what i've seen with my clients they've moved fast that's very different than than what i see here yeah here the, here i feel like they they they're incredibly laid back for for for, for I me i think yeah so here how it is like you have to go to them with the concept yes yeah definitely it's yeah, not, yeah yeah it's yeah it's like yeah. it's the other way around yeah Yeah. So you have to go to them they they've launched something new maybe a new car or a new machine okay so you have to go to them and they'll just call and they'll just call and they'll tell you you know Farin we've launched this glass hmm so you have to go back and tell them what can we do with the glass how do we market it <laughs> <laughs> so this is what it is well but realistically i mean there's only four big companies well f- technically five if you include alba but it's either almoyed uh koheji kanu that's about it yeah right i mean you're you're as a marketing you're either working for one of the five in that perspective of larger corporations or you're 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 struggling that's it's yeah. <laughs> it's really either that or nothing yes yes so you have to choose uh, like as i mentioned like you have to choose your your genre the clients uh like also th- the project should also excite you whether that's something that would interest you mm. so that's how you move forward and just you're you're only focused on what on traditional media from the magazine so uh, apart from the magazine so we work 360 okay so it's social media it's online digital so whatever the the client wants mm Uh, we we offer them 360 degree marketing mm. including you know even sms marketing for instance people still oh, still yeah. do that that also we offer does that work very well or not so much uh i think it works uh based on the activation so for instance that there there's something that's on an offer offers work very well mm. because we we've seen that but in order to do sms you'd have to you'd have to either have a a a a database yes so uh, with the phone numbers or so, you have to contact Betelco or STC yeah, which so, costs a lot of money no so how we work is that the clients usually give us their database that they want to reach out to so we work with so that so lazy <laughs> don't, don't record this <laughs> sorry. so lazy <laughs> sorry. sorry oh my god <laughs> we have our own individual database as well yeah which But from past clients you take the numbers and you put it into that database no so the, this is a database that has been that, that we worked on okay so these are the clients that we've worked maybe the team has met you know they've entered mm. so that is already there 
because the uh, the other or the only other option is to contact Patel or SDC and getting that yeah. database from them, which is like, very expensive. Expensive, yeah. I, I, th- I don't remember how much they charge per phone number, but it is yeah. it's not exactly cheap. Yeah, I mean you can contact other companies, um, Nike, Adidas, and that kind of like line also offer it. Yeah. But it's more difficult. But, yes. Because you have to speak directly to the marketing team, and it's a whole headache process. It's not too easy. Yes. But yeah, so tell me more about the Namaste Bahrain. Is that correct? Yeah. Can you bring it over, Akashi, so we can show it to the camera? So how long has this magazine been up and running? So this is our first edition that we've done. This is your first edition? Yeah. And you didn't even sign it? I feel insulted. So there you go. So tell me about it. So Namaste Bahrain uh, is basically a celebration of bilateral friendship. Mm-hmm. between India and Bahrain. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, um, Indians have contributed to the growth of uh, the economy mm-hmm. in Bahrain. So, basically, we've uh, showcased brands mm-hmm. that are, you know, contributing mm-hmm. uh, to the economy. And simultaneously, what we've done, we've also expanded in terms of uh, investors back in India who are looking at investing in Bahrain. Okay. Yes. And what are what are the most investors interested from Bahrain's perspective? The easy market that is to the U.S. because they have a unilateral agreement between Bahrain and the U.S. for import and export between the two countries, or are investors just looking at from a real estate property aspect? So, like for instance, uh, investors in terms of you know reaching out to the GCC market. Oh, interesting. Yes. Okay. So yes. so they so they use it basically as a docket. So, for instance, there is so the cli- like we featured some clients. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there is a lady; she runs this uh, bridal shop. Mm-hmm. So she's into these b- bridal dresses, couture, and couture fashion. Mm-hmm. So they are based in in Bombay. Haute couture. Uh, it's they are into these Indian. Okay. Yeah. Because haute couture is French. That's why. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, this is not. This is not that. So this is basically Indian. Okay. Indian haute couture. Uh, yeah. I like that. Yeah. So they are into these embroidery and all these stuff. So, you know, they want to reach the Bahrain market. So nowadays it's become very easy to sell things online and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, invest. Mm-hmm. And especially Bahrain makes it very easy. It's one of the, I think, the easiest investment uh, process. Locations. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's what, that's the advantage what we have. So the, she's she has her coutures and she she wants to have them here in a warehouse to then ship to the rest of the GCC? No, she wants to take up a, a, a showroom. She wants to take up a showroom? Showroom, yes. Okay, like in Seif Mall or, or somewhere yes, like that? Yes, yes. Okay. So, so, then, so then there are, you know, a couple of uh, people who approached me. They said, you know, we want to uh, be a part of the magazine mm-hmm. because we want to, uh, you know, showcase our brands. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And how many, do you mind me asking, well, this is your first your first publication, so it's unfair. Yeah. But how many expected readers do you think, how many, well, I can ask this, how many magazines have you printed? The uh, the, the printed, we've printed about 5,000 copies. 5,000, okay. Yes. And, so and how do you distribute actually, them? So we have our, distri- we have our own internal distribution channel, mm-hmm. which is our, uh, one of the team members. Mm-hmm. So they, they are hand delivered to the client. Okay. Yes. And so we have a fixed uh database okay and then when we meet new clients we give them a copy and then they also tell us to add them to the database that's how it works ah, okay yeah. here's a here's a really good tip um if you you put this in an envelope yeah and then you go to dhl and then you find whatever uh, uh, uh consultancy for anyone who's listening any con- uh, uh, embassy that you want and then you put the name of the ambassador on the the receiver end and then HTC, FedEx, or DHL will, when they deliver it, you're ensured that the ambassador himself will get a copy. Will get a copy. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that isn't that smart, right? Of course, the secretary will open it, obviously. Yes. But at least that that's your entryway yeah. into it. Yeah. So you can use FedEx and and DHL for for getting people's like products in their hand. Yeah, you're right. What a, that's what a, a good idea. What a friend of mine used to do for for trying to get high end clients was he would get an, a cheap iPad and then get a jailbroken so that when you when you turn it on, it would play a video, mm-hmm. which would be their market, the sales pitch. And then he would choose five or six very, very high-end clients, do the same exact process that I, that I just said, go to DHL, find their name, send it to their address or their office. So when they open the package, it's an iPad 
I go, who's sending me an iPad? And as soon as they turn it on, it plays a video, which is his sales pitch. Wow. Isn't that smart? That's, that's really smart. Mm, he's, he's made good money. Yeah. I think uh, last year he made about 10 to $15 million. Wow. Yeah. And that's just through, <laughs> through little games like that. Yeah. The yeah. The iPad. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's, there's a lot of opportunities in ways. But what made you want to start a magazine, though? Of all the things you could do, all the times, you, all the things you could spend your time and money on. So you could say that it's your. I mean, you just yeah. publicized it. I'm sorry, I'm giving you content. <laughs> <laughs> no. So uh, the uh, the idea behind Namaste Var because I come from a magazine and background. A, sure. Yeah, and you know we are we've been into I've been into books mm -hmm. and coffee table books over the last ten years of my life, even in back in Oman. So then I thought, you know, why not start and then maybe do things which you f which you feel were not there previously mm -hmm. with the other publications. Well, I'm like, I'll tell you again, I'm trying to give you a sales pitch so you can use it for your content and distribute it or whatever. <laughs> I'm sorry. We don't have to talk about your magazine if you don't want to. <laughs> no, I would like to talk, but then it, that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's interesting. I, it, it's, and do you do online as well or just physical print? So we do have social media mm -hmm. and then our website is now in process. Okay. Yeah. For the magazine. So it'll, the, the content will also go online okay. as well. Yeah. Because I know there's another lady. I forget, do you remember her name, Akashi? We went to meet at her office. Uh, yeah. They just started also a magazine publication print. But focused on jewelry? Only jewelry. Only jewelry. Okay. And they publish every quarter. And they're publishing the first print next month. In, okay. And it's focused around exactly your market, Indian market. Um, but for high-end Bahraini goods. And I think it's like, it's pretty big. It's, I think if she told me it's like 50 pages. 50 pages, okay. It's, it's quite a... It's, it's You've seen the copy? Uh, I've seen some of the copy. Okay, because I think if, if it's the first print, have they printed it already? They said they've already printed it. Okay. Um, and yeah, so it's mainly focused on like high-end goods and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. They claim that they've really sold every spot on it. Whether that's true or not is I don't know. I haven't heard of it. But yeah, so... <laughs> Sorry to tell you about your competitor <laughs> immediately. At least you've really got it out in, in, in the wild. <laughs> no, we don't need to put this, but I'll tell you, I know them. You know them, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And I've seen their marketing uh, like this. Okay. Ask Farah, she also knows them. Farah, uh, you know them as well? <laughs> <laughs> it's, is, it so, is it so boring? <laughs> it's like this. It's Saya. Saya. Oh, yeah. Yeah? So the marketing is what? Right? So you can ask me mm. on the book. Mm. And then I want you to ask me a separate que uh, question on why, what was the reason behind Namaste Bhari. Okay. So yeah. from the book, you want to talk to the, to the magazine? Both. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the book, The Guiding Light. Yeah, The Guiding Light. Because yeah. I, I, I looked into it. I think I bought a copy. You bought a copy? Okay. Yes. But I haven't had the time to finish reading it. Uh, as you can see here, these every guest that we bring on who's, who's a published author yeah. brings their book and then they sign it or whatever. So we have it there in the backdrop. Okay. Uh, we had two girls on. One who wrote a f her first book at 14. Wow. Can you imagine that? At 14. Great. And then she wrote her second one at 16. Wow. And then we had another girl on who wrote one book at 16 and another one at 18. Wow. Um, That's the really good. Very inspiring. It's crazy, no? Yeah. Did he break something? But uh, what was I about to say? Yeah, so, so I, for, I forgot her name. Uh, she wrote her first book around 14, then her second at 16. She's, she's Iranian. She's Iranian and got in trouble because of the book. Oh, really? Yeah, and so she left Iran to be in Bahrain and is now studying to do her medical degree as a doctor. Interesting. Isn't that fascinating? Yes, it Mashallah is. Mashallah Yeah. I, I, was, I was nowhere near that competent at the age of 16. 16 yes. <laughs> I don't think so. Even I would have thought. But yeah. She, didn't she invent her own language? Yes, she 
Yeah. Her own language. <laughs> wow. Yeah. For her book. For her book. Yeah. Great. So for two characters that were talking, she invented like a whole, <laughs> a whole thing. Yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah. I <laughs> mean, hey, you know what? If it works, it works. Yeah. We do the show with e-tron from Audi and all of that. At the end of the seventh show, mm. uh, the one of the ladies who was the guest, she bought the car. Oh. So, so the client is happy, right? <laughs> Because the job is done. Now, I had put it on my channels, on my personal uh, Instagram and all of that. So there is this uh, Indian FM called 104.2. Mm. So there is this RJ called Juhi. Mm. Okay. So I told you, na, people don't use their creativity. She saw that. Now they've done this. They've copied me. And if I show you both the videos, <laughs> they are doing it with a Chinese car. <laughs> I like that. More accessible to the market. They're like, hey, you know what? <laughs> And the people that they're interviewing are the people who are never going to buy the Chinese car. I love it. I love it. I love it. It was so funny when I looked at it. I said, what's wrong? I said, where has your creativity gone? I mean, okay, they also want And same way. I'm meeting the client. Hi, nice to meet you. Let's same way. Same script copy. Hey, if it works, it works. What is it? The, the greatest compliment is, 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 is copying, right? It's the greatest flattery. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've had the same experience. Like we've had past guests on who, who, who I've then heard through other sources. That, it's crazy, it's crazy. Yeah, that they wanted to start a podcast. And I'm like, cool, go for it. I'm happy for you. Do it, yeah. do it, go. So off the hook. Mm. So this uh, girl who works with Red House, okay. So basically, she is from a place in India, uh, Haryana. Mm. So the Haryanvi accent is very different from a normal Indian accent, which I have or which anybody has. Okay. So for instance, Prague. 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 <laughs> okay. So that, per that girl is now selling bar in this month. I love it. Okay. I love it. <laughs> so now listen. <laughs> Then... She calls this client. Uh, it's like a fintech company. And say, hi, this, we are coming this month with this supplement. You have to advertise. It's like, excuse me, what do you mean you have to advertise? It's like, no, you have to because, you know, last year you advertised, so this year you advertise. He's like, <laughs> he's like Fareen would never talk to me like this. But I'm not Fareen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've seen that. I've understood that. <laughs> Then he calls up. George, he said, what's wrong with this girl? So George says, please give us business, give us business. We need the money. I said, no, I'm not giving. Mm. She calls me and says, you have to add us. What is this? See, that's how now it's become. But I, I never understood like the business practices here, here, in, here in Bahrain with the idea of like, like how, how almost it's a, almost like for companies, it almost becomes like a charity run, right? To yeah. keep your business alive, which yeah. I, I've never understood. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Get out yeah. of here. Move. <laughs> But I would say one thing, like uh, I have been very, uh, you know, I have a lot of respect for the bloggers that we work with because mm. they have supported us. And uh, uh, this is this is a way to get that cut, right? <laughs> no, I don't do this with them. <laughs> you <laughs> to lower their fees. <laughs> yeah. No, not lower the fees. I always give whatever is the is the rate that's offered. We always uh, make sure that they get that. Mm. Uh, but they have always been supportive and they have worked towards promoting like whatever, whichever bloggers we work with. They they have made sure that, you know, they have not just done, uh, you know, they have they have done justice. Like they have spent like more than three hours over a, you know, video recording for a, a you know, food review or something on those lines. So that's what I have uh, liked with them. And then, uh, so I would like to, you know, like I would always, so th this is something that I would like to say. All right. We'll keep, we'll make it into a snippet. We'll make it interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Which, who's your favorite, who's your favorite blogger? My favorite. I can't yeah. name one. You can't name them, one? Yeah. La I think your favorite is Bahrain Barbie? Bahrain Nail? Barbie. I have heard of her. So clearly not your favorite. Um, I have been Dana? Dana Zubari, yeah. She's good. She's into fitness. Then yeah. So fitness is important for you. Okay. Fitness and then food. Uh, Farah is really good. Farah is really good. And then uh, there is this other blogger. Uh, that Nizan? Name. Nizan. Or Dana. Zab Dana. Donna Wonders. Uh, there is the Bahrain foodie. 
behind Fudi, yeah. She's good, and then so there are a couple of them. Uh, can't recall the name because I'm very bad with Instagram handles. Mm. And there's a lot of them as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but most of them I know them by their name, so I. Mm. So I could just say that you know Ibrahim is also good. I know him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The from BRM blogs. Yeah. Yeah. You should check out uh, Spooky Gigi. Spooky Gigi. Okay. Yeah. Okay. He's he's I think the one of the biggest, if not the biggest. Uh, I don't know if influencer is the right word, but he has almost like seven hundred and thousand, almost a million followers on Instagram alone. That's where Bahrain. Yeah. He lives directly in Bahrain, and it's gone. That's to, that's really cool. That's amazing. That's that's yeah. unbelievable, and that's not even fake. That's like like real legit. followers, like legit. Yeah. He gets about like almost a hundred thousand views on YouTube. He's wow. If we're for a guy in Bahrain doing yeah. Bahrain, yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. So even back in India, so uh, we also work on you know very specific projects uh, with in Bombay. Mm. So, for instance, there are some of these bloggers that we worked with. Uh, they are really big. Uh, there is this blogger called Masoom Minawala. She's actually been invited for the Cannes Film Festival. Oh, nice. She's on. Uh, she's a L'Oreal brand ambassador. Um, she's with L'Occitane. Uh, you know all these brands, Chanel, Dior. All these brands come under her, and she supports a lot of Indian um, Indian brands mm. like these. You know, mid-range designers. Mm-hmm. So she she does works towards supporting them all of that, and then there is this other blog. Uh, there are these two girls. They are called House of Miso. Oh, I know that. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they also they are also doing a fantastic job. Uh, they are supporting local brands. So both of them are you know one is uh, one is with a kid and the other is uh, you know just newly married. Mm, mm. So you know some of them they do have interesting content. The camera companies, especially the higher-end models, try to limit their supply as much as possible, and then they create a whole separate industry, which is the renting in- industry. Okay. And so the yes. renting generates them a lot of capital. Yes, of course, yeah. So, so I know a lot of guys who who have these great relationships with the suppliers started rental companies, and within the first three months, that ten thousand BD camera has already paid for itself. Of course, yeah. And they've, so they've they've made up. They made the up their margins. Of- yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, from from after the three months, it's just profit. It's just profit, yeah. So there's it's it's fascinating, no? <laughs> <laughs> that is, yeah. Yeah. Anyways, so let's get back onto the normal topics. Um, you were the ta- book. we were talking about your 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 released book, Guiding Light. Yes. Tell me about it. I haven't had a chance to read it fully yet. The Guiding Light. The Guiding Light. So there's this very interesting story. Uh, so I think it was 2000 and t- 2012 is when I moved to Bahrain mm-hmm. and um, I had gone to meet a client and so he just generally he asked me a question that are you into meditation and uh, so I said a-, a bit of meditation but not really into meditation. So we were just having like a generic convers- uh, conversation and then he said you know there is uh, have you heard of Art of Living? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it is a center in India, and they are they are uh, into meditation and things like that. So there is this international women's conference that's taking place in Bangalore, where you've got women from 40, uh, 47 countries. So you know we want to extend an invitation to you to be a part mm-hmm. of the conference from the media and attend the conference. So I was like very excited, you know, going for an international. A conference where you've got women participating from 47 countries so that's when I went and that was the first time that was my first encounter with art of living and the ashram and when you enter the ashram it's actually a very cool place you've got everything is in the order everything is you know very super clean food is amazing all of that and then I met uh, the founder of Art of Living, uh, who is Shri Shri Ravi Shankar. Mm-hmm. And then uh, his sister is uh, Bhanu Didi, that mm-hmm. we call her. Uh, so uh, she actually, uh, she's into women empowerment projects, girl child education. So they've got 47 different schools in India, uh, you know, wh- where they offer free education to... 47, wow. Okay. Yes, where they offer free education to... Uh, underprivileged children 
so they are they were a lot into this so there is this specific library or i think it was a bookstore inside the ashram where you know we were going and we were picking out uh, taking out books uh, on there there were books on meditation on guidance a lot of books on shri shri ravi shankar the founder of art of living but there was no book on bhanu didi the the, the sister so then i said there's no book on her and then uh, i asked uh, her she saying no most of the books are on the other subjects so then i said i said i'm interested in writing your biography oh okay so she's like this is the first time someone has asked me so uh, so then that was our conversation finished there in uh, and then after 2 months they mo- they came to bahrain on a trip mm mm-hmm. and then i met her again and then i told her you know i'm really interested in writing your biography because based on whatever i've experienced at the ashram and you know whatever courses i did you have these meditation courses that you do so she was like okay please go ahead and that's when i started writing and then so i'm the official biographer for her book and then the book was then again released it took me 2 years and then it was again released at the ashram where they had the the next uh, conference where again it was the international women's conference and uh, it was published by harper collins mm-hmm. so that's the, uh, the the story so you should read the book because i will i will yeah. i really bought it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> money spent now just i need the time to read it <laughs> yes yes so it was basically my life changing experience of uh, you know how meditation actually changes the way you think okay and the way you feel you can you can do things so give me an example how were you before how are you after so you could say that you know so we have 24 hours in a day mm-hmm. so before you could say that maybe i'm completing three task in a day with a lot of difficulties and after doing this i'm i just say bring it on bring it on <laughs> whatever comes my way yeah i get it done so, so you're much more relaxed yes yes okay yes Are you more proactive or more passive now? More proactive. Okay. And uh, and then I feel that there is a lot more energy than what it was earlier. Mm-hmm. And I'm very focused like so if I'm giving attention to something between 9 to 10 I make sure I give my 100% attention to that specific project. Okay. So my mind doesn't uh, fluctuate. Okay. And then 11 again you know you 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 switch on. Okay. So now I'm at the gym so I'm dedicated to the gym so you're a big avid reader you've written your first book are you impl- are you right now working on your second book yes i am can i ask what's it called so it's actually a fiction mm-hmm. uh book so it's called 86 ripon street okay yeah so it's set in england no not exactly set in england so uh it's actually set in new york because okay. that's one of my favorite cities in the world okay Yeah so it's the story of uh, this author who's sitting by uh, the 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 lake mm-hmm. and then um, she actually uh, encounters this other female uh, who is uh, thinking of committing suicide mm-hmm. and after that that uh, she she tries to save her and then that woman goes into coma So the only word that she uh, before going to coma that she 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 she'll ask her like who you are what are you about where where can how can we help you get home so the only word that she talks about is this street 86 Ripon Street so now it's her journey to find out what 86 Ripon Street is all about what is her story mm. yeah so that's what it is yeah how far how close are you from being done I'm almost done you're almost done yeah so I'm like I've completed about eighty thousand words. So this this is going to be about 120. Okay. So yeah. it's a proper novel. Yeah, yeah, it's a proper novel, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, it's how close uh, well, fantastic, fantastic. So you've got the ending ready in your head or you're still deciding? Yeah, so so I've been working on this over the last 3 years. Okay. Yeah. So it's been a lot of research on different aspects of uh, life and then, you know, on on different elements so that has been there a lot of research whatever uh, you know the the speed work that i had to do that's done so mm. now it's just uh, close to the conclusion <laughs> i remember reading do you know how long it takes stephen king to finish a book yes i know it does 
three months three months he's a monster he writes 500 pages a day he says it, it, it doesn't 500 words or it was 500 500 words a day he said it doesn't matter I just get it done with in the beginning of the day yeah and that's it because you know the, the difference is that see he is a full-time author mm-hmm. so when you are a full-time author you know after breakfast you get on after lunch you know you're doing that so you you know that you have planned your day in that order but because we are working we have to you know uh, take out a different uh, time where you are relaxed and you know you've done you've done your work for the day and you've met everything you've done your job and then now you want to sit and relax and think of you know now how do i take my character to the next stage of where he or she wants to go i i forgot who it was um um i remember reading uh, one of the processes for another author i think he wrote um red submarine okay i don't remember the name of the book anymore but he he talks about that he writes a story backwards Okay. So he has the ending already done. Okay. That's that's and then he just tries to work out how the middle and the beginning connects to the ending. The completely the reverse way on it. Yeah. And then he always tries to to he always tries to think about what is a powerful sent, sentence. Uh I think he he uses this as an example the, he goes, the 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 statement. The statement. The yeah. The statement, yes. He goes um <clears throat> he gives an example of what a powerful statement is and he goes in quotes The first time I died kind of went like this which okay. is an amazing hook. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah. yeah to to then move on to the next move on to the next paragraph, yeah. yeah. And yeah. so that's how how like how he thinks about it. Yeah. So if you look at uh, authors all the authors they do spend you know maybe 10 minutes or 15 minutes they 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 do spend on meditation mm. because I think that's where they get their superpower. Well, it's it's fascinating that you say that because I, again, Stephen King said yeah. something very similar to that. He said he, he when he writes, he he looks at it like sitting around in a campfire, and each character brings him a little bit of wood to keep the fire alive. Alive. And he, he the hope is that the that he can finish the night with enough wood to keep burning. And then he also talks about the idea of sometimes you have an idea in in your head, and it just doesn't let go. And it's just brewing and it's just brewing and he talks about the the book he wrote um under the dome under the dome yes he said he he had the idea in his in his teens but it just was like this idea that kept coming back to him and he kept trying to fall asleep and it would always be there this this mm-hmm. thought and he said finally when he when he felt like he was good enough as an author as a, as a writer he then completed it he he elaborated and then worked on it yeah so actually stories are already there in our mind Mm. So when you sit and when you think of an idea uh, it can be an uh, epiphany or whatever so then you know then that that idea just st- gets stuck and that's when you decide you know I have to now make this into a novel or you know work work on it. No, I I I find writing I mean I've I've always wanted to write because I find it as a, it's a fascinating process and I, I I'm a huge avid reader such as yourself. I I find I and that's why I read so much about authors because I find them interesting as characters as caricatures of lives uh, the idea of of the struggle between writing something that is both concise and and readable yes, yes. and at the same time having it mean of meaningful meaningful <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and there's like this counter between these two weights yeah. in 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 your mind i mean uh, Stephen King always talks about that he he has great difficulties not wanting to open a thesaurus because you know experimenting with new words and and yeah that's and adding it. to it yeah so there's this uh, author um so sorry he's he's not into fiction books uh he's called Brian West mm-hmm. so he's into past life regression therapy mm-hmm. and all of that so there is this wonderful book that he's written it's called same souls different bodies mm-hmm. if you get an opportunity you should read that book it's amazing akash write it down look it up if you like yeah go for it let's let's check it out do you believe in in past lives i think uh, after reading that book i did a bit of research okay and then i decided that yes we are all connected in different ways but we are actually we are all connected basically it's brian wess uh w e s s 
so you can actually uh, go for yeah that's him i'll check it out yeah so you know many lies many master uh, have you have you uh, have you tried any i have read, uh, actually i have tried for really? regression therapy yes and it was amazing what did you see so basically you know what regression therapy is mm. regression therapy is now uh, all of us have you know some elements of difficulties or fear so i have a fear of heights so when i am at a very uh, you know when i when i'm i'm inside the elevator and suppose i'm on the uh, 30th floor and if the glasses all around me are transparent then i you know start getting that dizziness mm. so i want to understand what's the reason why do i have a, ph- a phobia of heights when i see things you know at a very high level and then i feel oh i'm going to fall now mm. so it ha- it is connected with your past life everything that you have today like suppose if a person is diabetic or if a person uh has some issues anger issues you know some sort of a trauma it's all connected to the pain in your past that got stuck in this life mhm and in order to break that that chain you have to go back to your past life to understand what went wrong fascinating yeah so fascinating. this is actually a different topic that we could <laughs> go into no yeah. definitely I, we yeah. should go in the future i mean it's already past 4 So we've yeah. gotten an overtime. Uh before we quickly finish, is there anything else you want to bring up any kind of topics quickly? I think all good? All good, yeah. We can do another episode in the future and we can dive more into the past life topic. Yes. I'm super interested. Let's definitely do yeah. it. Uh last thing I wanted to bring up there's a, you're doing a charity event uh on the 24th? Yes. What so, is it about? So this is basically an association Pink Media House is partnering with uh, the Pakistani Women's Association. Mm-hmm. So we are basically it's a, it's a fundraising event where we are uh, you know raising funds for an education fund that PWA has. And simultaneously we are also releasing a book Uh, which has been produced by Pink Media House it's called Pakistan on the move mm-hmm. uh we are featuring 25 entrepreneurs business leaders in the book who are all of uh, you know who are all pakistanis and they have added uh, to the glory and to the you know sorry maybe we can do this again <laughs> repeat <laughs> i have to be very specific about what i said can we do this again okay of course <laughs> so <clears throat> you have um You have an event. So I heard you've got a charity event coming up soon. Yes. So this uh, charity event is called uh, Pink Goes Green. So we have actually collaborated with uh, the Pakistani Women's Association uh, to bring out a limited edition coffee table book which is called uh, Pakistan on the Move. Uh, we are basically featuring 25 entrepreneurs, business leaders who have uh, contributed to the growth of Bahrain. and simultaneously we are also uh, raising funds for uh, uh, for a charity which is called uh, the education fund for uh, for PWA education so, fund PWA yeah, yes so and it's an education fund for for PWA and uh, they are basically the I, the concept behind this, this is that to support the underprivileged children in bahrain who are unable to afford a decent education or who are unable to go to school So reach out to the audience right there and you can tell them if, if people wanted to get involved, people want to know more about it, people maybe want to support it, how could they go about doing it? So uh, we would like you to support us for this cause by, you know, uh, following us on our Instagram channel which is pinkmediahouse.me and pwa and all the details of the registration link all the details are already mentioned there so just follow us support us and buy the uh, the ticket for this event thank you <laughs> what did you say thank you the that was so weird <laughs> so, so can you cut that part <laughs> no we're definitely giving that in that's funny <laughs> <laughs> no, no 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 please cut it <laughs> okay well you've heard it here first um the event is on the 24th yes uh if you are able to support even if you can just throw a like or just a follow that'll be a great help and um yeah and if and spread the word around and spread the word around yeah yes. the way you can do right do be the be the force of change that you want to see in the world i appreciate you having you coming on 
And uh, yeah, it's been wonderful. Let's talk about the event. Let's see if we can do something. Sure. Thank you.